Okay, welcome. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bennett and I'm the founder here at Laraday and I'm coming to you today from Williams Treaty Territory in Peterborough, Ontario. So, so great to see you all. Um, I'm really excited to do this. First, uh, maybe just a little bit of context. I don't know about you guys, but when we listen to a really great podcast, it's this sort of like really intensely private act. Um, you know, your mind lights up and you experience it and then you just kind of move on. And so this week, uh, Simon Sinek on his podcast, his guest was Brene Brown. And their conversation, you know, it started with politics, asking the question, exactly where did things go off the rails? And it ended with religion. Like more specifically, what's the definition of faith? Uh, along the way, they touched on Faust and failures in leadership and the Berlin Wall and world peace and white male power. And that was all before they got to the things you'd actually expect them to talk about, like, like vulnerability and shame, and of course, start with why and the infinite game. So I didn't want to talk, I didn't want to just think about these things alone. And so I put out uh, a call to some friends of Laraday, longstanding clients and staff and uh, Laraday alumni. And um, I just asked, you know, if you're free and interested, I'd love some company and support to think through this podcast, because there's so much there to unpack and you all answered the call. Here you are. It's so great. So if we end up posting this uh, conversation somewhere and you're listening in, welcome. Uh, we'll link to the original podcast, of course, uh, as well as to Laraday, so you can find out more about us if you want. So let's jump in. Uh, I'm going to facilitate. Uh, I'm going to kick off by asking you to introduce yourself. And uh, my first question is, tell us, tell us what one thing really resonated with you in the podcast. So um, I'll start with, uh, with Laura and then uh, second, I'll go to Julie. Hi everyone, I'm Laura Gon. I'm the executive director of Literary Press Group of Canada, which is an association of uh, literary publishers across Canada. And uh, I also uh, was not so long ago at Laraday myself and for almost five years. And um, I think the, the line that jumped out, and I'm going to have to paraphrase it because I don't have it exactly, but the line that jumped out to me um, <laughs> repeated several times was uh, by Brene Brown was vulnerability without boundaries isn't authentic or something. I'm not sure what the last word was, but it's not true vulnerability. Yeah, that was a great one. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Great to see you. Uh, let, let's go to Julie and then to Nicola. Good morning, everybody. I'm Julie Davis. I'm Vice President of External Relations and Advancement at Trent University. And uh, I've been very in depth with uh, both Brene Brown and Simon Sinek over many years. So like Jonathan was, was fangirling over the combination. Um, and so a lot of things I'd, I'd heard and thought about before, but I wasn't familiar with the finite and infinite games. And, and then I you know, went for a walk after the end of the day and talked to my husband about it. I woke up thinking about it. I went back and listened to it a bit this morning. And uh, what really, uh, the, the kind of the line that I really liked was, you know, playing for the good of the whole means there's no finish line. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a great book, The Infinite Game. Mm -hmm. It's so good. Um, great to see you, Julie. Uh, let's go to Nicola and then uh, to Kim. Hi everyone, I'm Nicola Lyle and I'm the Director of Administrative Services with Peterborough Child and Family Centres. And what jumped out at me was around the same section that Laura was talking about. Um, and again, I don't really have the line, but it was when she was telling the story of the, um, the guy that came to her afterward and said, oh, I'm gonna be all vulnerable now. I'm just gonna you know, put it all out there. Um, and her saying, you know, essentially that's not gonna work very well, but you do need to tell someone and when she asked the group um, if, if they thought he should tell someone, nobody put their hand up. And I just thought that was so ironic in a group talking about vulnerable leadership that we just have so far to go still. Oh, we totally do. <laughs> Thanks, Nicola. Uh, let me go to Kim and then to you get. Uh, this was such a, a dense and rich um, podcast. Uh, it was everything. Everything was in there. But I think uh, what I've really been thinking about since listening to it, and then I've listened to it again, is the discussion about stories and the importance of stories. And, I, and I've been struggling for a while with the limitations of stories and, and some doors open, um, that the stories are important 
and then like boundary or like um, vulnerability, there has to be some boundaries or that organizational infrastructure, I think. Oh, that's so great. I'm sure we'll come back to that. <laughs> that's great, Kim. Cheers. Uh, let's go to Yuget and then to Alness. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yuget Vanderpost, and I know most of you on this screen, which is really lovely. Had a real pleasure working with you already. Joined Laraday just over a year ago, um, and I spend lots of time in the training services of um, training managers and leaders, and so that's really exciting. And prior to that, I've been a longtime educator and, and head of a school, so um, this has been a really great joining this team. Uh, I'm I'm like a huge Brené believer, you know, uh, read all her books, all that sort of stuff, um, and Simon Sinek. So bringing these together was really great. Um, <clears throat> I often take notes when I'm listening to something, and I just kept coming back to the same thing that has actually been resonating with me, and it's that. Um, Brene says, why sits on top of the three-legged stool and her three-legged stool of, you know, thought, emotion, behavior. And then it's that idea that it has to sit there so that we don't do the or all the time. We're thinking of the and. Um, so that's what resonated nice. with me. Nice one. Thanks, you get. Hey, uh, let's go to Alness and then to Diane. Hi, everyone. I'm Alness, Operations Manager at Laraday. Um, I also found the podcast pretty interesting. I think uh, the thing that probably stuck with me most um, was the how we're getting less practice at having challenging conversations uh, in person and how due to just how easy it is to message or have asynchronous conversations, we're kind of offloading uh, that kind of practice to things that are a little less painful and a little less challenging. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. That was awesome. Thanks, Honest. Uh, Diane and then Montana. I'm the newest member of the Laraday team. I just joined this week, uh, part of UGET's training and coaching team. After 15 years as CEO at Five Counties Children's Center, retiring in August and coming out sort of this week. Uh, love the podcast too, like UGET said. These two folks have been my leadership gurus for many years. Uh, and I think what resonated with me on this was you can't scare someone into following you. You have to inspire them and how much more difficult it is to draft that positive story that inspires people to follow you and how easy it is to scare people with the negative and how people, and I guess one of the things that's always been my goal in an organization is to get rid of the us against them. We're all in it together. And it's easy for people to gain intimacy against a common enemy. So that was all in the podcast. And I found all of that really resonated. And I think the getting rid of the binary thinking is going to be really important for all of us over the next few years. Thanks, Diane. Awesome. Montana. Hey, everybody. I am Montana Scott. I am an associate consultant at Laraday. It's wonderful hearing your thoughts because it's just bringing back so much about the podcast and Kim, you're right, it is so dense. Um, what resonated with me is the idea of spirituality, um, being knowing that you're on the same team um, with people you might not know that are there. And that connectedness is just that really, that spoke to me. So can't wait to hear more today. That was awesome. Um... Yeah, and as I mentioned at the start, my name's Jonathan. Uh, I think the thing that jumped out for me the biggest uh, of all was actually not uh, maybe necessarily what they said, but it was this it was this moment. It was pretty early on, and uh, Simon's summing up all this stuff, and she says, "I disagree," and he says, "Go on," <laughs> and I just I just love that minute moment partly because uh, in a way. Uh, he um, summed up uh, both of their careers. And she said, in a way, uh, yeah, I'll be doing the summing up of my career, thanks very much. Uh, 10 minutes later, they actually agreed that in fact, they didn't really disagree with one another. Uh, and I just really loved that moment. I loved as much that she said, I disagree. And as much that he said, go on. 
Uh, and there's a level of modeling there that uh, we don't see enough of when it comes to men and listening. And I just thought it was a really uh, beautiful moment. So um, that was great. Uh, I uh, probably could start uh, one of 27 places right now, but let's just pick a place and, and, and kind of dive in and, and, and go from, from there. Um, probably it won't surprise you that I'm super interested in hearing some more about storytelling. Uh, Kim, you uh, began to talk about, about stories and storytelling there um, and, and boundaries uh, and those sorts of things. Would you, would you like to kind of like uh, unpack that a little bit more? And um, if folks want to jump in, uh, just use the raise your hand thing or wave at me. Kim? Mm. Um, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, and these are very raw thoughts. Um, so I've been, you know, hearing about storytelling as a, as a tool for gathering information and evaluation and, you know, telling the stories of, of our successes and our challenges. And um, there have been a few parts of me that have just been tugging. So I often think of decisions um, or conversations happening around, um, you know, the big parachute game that kids play when they're little. So I just have this imagining of we're all standing around the parachute and we have to hang on to it with both hands with just the right amount of tension. So I do that internally as well. <laughs> um, so while I love the idea of telling stories and I know they can be real, they can be so inspiring. I've also been aware that there are limitations and we, if we don't understand what the intent is or how to approach the storytelling. And so what I heard in the podcast were um, some some of the cautions or some of the important pieces about storytelling and, and weaving in the, um, you know, the rational thought with the engaging leadership, um, inspiring people to join. And so uh, the frame, so it becomes really clear that there's a framework behind storytelling as a tool that we need to understand. Otherwise, could we be using it um, in the way that that one guy talked about uh, his vulnerability, which was really manipulation. Yeah, that was a beautiful moment, wasn't it? Um, let me go uh, to Laura, who thinks about storytelling a lot as well. Um, what, what piece of that uh, kind of resonated with you? Uh, there, was, there was that line where he sort of said, you know, like uh, uh, without any kind of action, um, it's just marketing. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was kind of a nice line, Laura. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I guess I had another thought in my mind about storytelling and but that marketing bit of really resonated with me because I, I constantly I think just the way we consume information in this world, I constantly kind of parse that marketing message out and kind of try to evaluate it. But so for me, it's important to, to kind of look to intentions, I think, and, and look beyond that automatic check in I do for marketing. Um, I don't know if this fits with the podcast message so much, but one thing that I've just thought, even just hearing the few words here is about framing stories. Um, for example, uh, maybe some people can, can uh, relate to this, you know, at thinking about like the world we're in right now and, uh, how people's businesses are threatened and, uh, nonprofits are certainly struggling. Um, I've been kind of, I'm, I do have a kind of a realist or some, some would say pessimistic take on things. And so I've been constantly kind of in the back of my mind, like, isn't it great? We got all this emergency funding for COVID, but two years from now we're getting cut. Like you, you can't believe it. So what are we going to do? And like, I'm kind of projecting out that pessimism. And then I talked to somebody yesterday who's very experienced and, and has been around the field I'm in a lot. And he was like, we know you can't cut your way out of a recession. This is stimulus. This is job creation, mm. all of these extra supports. And so I thought to myself, yeah, that is how I'm going to talk about it from now on. That's the story that this essential aid has helped us all do our essential things. Right. right. So anyway, sorry, reframing stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, totally, totally. Um, Nancy uh, Johnson's also joined us. Uh, Nancy, do you want to say hi? Um, what, uh, we're just talking about, about the podcast and about, about stories. What, um, what jumped out at you uh, in, in it? Um, lots. Hi, everybody. Hello, Diane Pick. <laughs> That's awesome to see you there. 
Um, Nancy, when I saw your name, I was so excited to get to see your face. <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you too, Diane. Um, lot stood out for me. Um, one of lots of things in my head. I wrote lots of notes. I've listened to it twice, but I feel like I need to listen to it again. Right. What I got out of the first time completely different than what I got out of the second time. Right. As, as Kim said, it's just so it's so dense and meaty. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, but a couple of things that stood out for me is is certainly I'm always interested in looking at how do we build how do we build deep meaningful connections, and that just is more important to me now than ever really um, mm -hmm. within my organization as well as within the world. And the other thing too that I really liked was about. And I think in nonprofits, we can sometimes do this is that sense of, you know, the, the vision and the inspiration can leave, leave when a leader leaves. So how do we, how do we do that more? Like really build it within that strong foundation of the organization so that when a leader leaves, all that really good meaty stuff doesn't leave with, with the leader. So that was the other thing that I was thinking about. That, yeah. that was the, the cult of personality piece was super interesting. And they both kind of cocked to it, didn't they, in the podcast? They both basically have built companies that are personal brands, uh, which I thought was kind of a kind of a, re a revealing moment. Uh, yeah. Julie, what's on your mind as you're as you're hearing this? Yeah, I, it, it's, it's very timely because uh, Trent's founding president passed away um, on, on the first day of the year. And, and so um, you know, there was a line, great organizations and great movements light a torch that can be passed. Um, but I think part of what we're hearing and seeing is you have to, that story has to resonate with you personally. And once it becomes a part of you, then that story changes. And your own experiences and your own um, interpretation of that narrative becomes part of that story. But really the art of leadership then I think is how you weave all of those stories together so that it's still um, got a common narrative that, that brings other people onto the team. And so obviously with, with his passing, many, many, many stories are shared from generations, from students right back, you know, in, in 1963 to students, you know, in, in 1983 and, and, you know, 2020 and finding, you know, that, that common narrative and how that uh, creates spaces for everybody to attach themselves like Velcro, right? What is your uh, yeah. that all of the, the hooks are that we attach ourselves to, I think is that's the art of the leader and trying to, you know, bring that story together through the generations so that, you know, there is no end, that infinite game that everybody feels attached to it. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you get what's on your mind as you're hearing all of this, what's jumping out for you? Well, um, for those of you who know me, Jonathan knows me pretty well. I've just, it's, if you could be inside my brain right now, <laughs> you would see like <laughs> all this electricity as it's trying to connect pick, all these pick things. Pick one thing, but pick one thing you get. <laughs> I'm going in, I'm going in. I think the thing that's resonating at the top is this idea of the leadership and the, the succession passing on. Mm -hmm. um, a big thing that, that I myself as a leader have tried to then evolve to is giving myself permission to connect in the way that I like to connect, not around these social constructs that we think um, is the best way to connect and create connections. And so I think uh, the piece around self-awareness um, is resonated with me and again reminded me to give myself permission to connect to, with people in the way that means the most to me. And so that's a little bit what everyone has just said. Um, but yeah, that I just plant that into the space a little bit of how we actually choose to show up to, to learn about ourselves, yeah. And then how do we connect with that and how we work with others. Um, yeah. yeah, that's great. There was that line around, um, uh, around you know, is, is your intention as a leader self-focused or other focused? And uh, I, you know, I, I thought that was a really, uh, a really, really interesting uh, moment. Um, I'd love to go to Alness. Uh, Alness, there was there was this line uh, that that she uh, it was a quick line that she had, but it was around uh, like she described it as common enemy intimacy. 
Uh, and I don't know whether that jumped out at you, but you know, we live in this such a divisive uh, world and there was quite an interesting section, which I understood in marketing lens as being a value proposition to differentiators and you kind of need both, right? Um, what what kind of what kind of uh, resonated for you through that through that section? Because you uh, you do a lot of uh, a lot of marketing related work, so I was just kind of curious about your. Oh, that's put me on the hot seat on a trick. Sorry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, uh, yeah, well, it definitely. I, I remember them talking about um, how focusing on the positive can be uh, a lot more challenging than communicating yeah. via the negative. That whole yeah. idea that if we're talking about something that we all don't like we're probably all more willing to like jump on the boat and start rowing. Um, and that I find actually, now that you mention it, a lot of, a lot of messaging may be like that. Although it doesn't, ne the enemy doesn't necessarily need to be another group or another bunch of people. It can just be the pain that we're feeling and that we share and that we all want to work together to help solve. So I guess like my positive twist on that, I guess, and reflecting on it now is that a lot of the messaging that I seem see that is effective is resonating with pain points. Uh, and it's probably speaking to pain points where you're going to find more uh, catch or more, or more buy-in, I think. Nice one. Nice one. Montana, um, what, what is it about these two that has kind of been a breakthrough? It's like they're kind of, they're speaking the zeitgeist status or something. And sure, you know, I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's white, it's American, uh, it's middle class. And yet, and it's super capitalist for sure. I mean, they're, they're both, you know, like global superstars, but what, like somehow, and yet we take them seriously. What, what's that about? Well, I, when I was listening to their conversation and it does just feel like listening on their conversation, it was so refreshing to hear just two people who, hey, I'm not going to agree with you this whole time. Um, but they were still wonderful to hear and they weren't overpowering each other. They were interested in each other's thoughts. They developed their thoughts together. Um, and it didn't have that tension that you would feel um, when there's not that, ke that chemistry. And I think that we can also replicate that with good listening and um, choosing your boundaries and when to be vulnerable. Mm. So it's, mm. it's clear that they have a lot of trust in each other um, that's been established over the years so that they can have these conversations. Um, but I think that we're all kind of capable of saying, like you mentioned, uh, go on. Right, right. It's nice. Julie. Yeah, I, I wrote down um, early on, they were talking about um, language and they said, um, you know, what, what they do, and I think one of the reasons why they're so compelling is they make conceptually complex ideas accessible by using language that people didn't have before. And for me, it's, it's, you know, it's that framing and it gives us the language and the constructs that all of a sudden something we're thinking about like, okay, I'm going to think, that, you know, it, it, that makes sense. I can think about it and frame it and, you know, understand it and, and navigate it within this frame. So they create these, you know, this rich language, these concepts, these constructs that help you look at things in different ways and make sense um, of, of things that you're grappling with or things that are important to you. That, that's what I find about both of them is so compelling. It's true, isn't it? I mean, you can almost remember where you were when you first saw the, the two initial TED Talks, you know, and, and, and what they did, like what, what the circles and, and what the shame, <laughs> you know, you're like, that. That's the thing that I never quite finished my thought on, but fully articulated and fully experienced. And it, it does feel kind of like zeitgeist type, type stuff. Uh, you know, who knew, like Generation X, we got, a, we, we got people to speak uh, into, the, into the void, <laughs> kind of fun. Um, who can I go to next? Um, Nancy, you're hearing all this, what's jumping out for you? I think to just springboard off of what Montana was saying, um, one of the things that makes their conversation so like great is they do have that skill set um, to connect and the, the, the one that really stood out for me and they do it so genuinely is curiosity, mm. right? Mm. And, and 
like they're not faking that. You can't fake that stuff. Um, and that's what I think was so great about their conversation was just that natural and real authentic curiosity of each other's thoughts. And I really, really like that. Yeah, that's really great. Um, yeah, jump in, Laura. Sorry, uh, I, I was muted. Um, just uh, what Montana just wrote in the chat too, actually was something that really like the- Yeah, can you just read it out for us? Uh, yep. Uh, she said, um, they begin by breaking the dichotomy of good and bad. That sets the frame for the conversation. And actually like how much of our political and other discourse in life is now, is it good or is it bad? And it's so, uh, it's, it's mind numbing and it's probably a little bit heart deadening. And um, so that really resonated with me when they were talking about that and, and the, <laughs> the political leaders they were comparing, I didn't agree with saying anything positive about Ronald Reagan but the, uh, the, the political leaders of the past who were willing to lay out the stakes a little bit more honestly, be just be honest with the citizenry as compared to you can't, you just can't say those unpalatable truths now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, uh, that was super interesting to you. Um, let, me, let me shift gears just a tiny bit. Um, uh, you know, you all, uh, many of you run organizations or you're a leader inside organizations. Um, there was some kind of, uh, you know, more leadership and more uh, kind of, you know, we'll call it management type uh, things that kind of came out through the cracks. Um, there was that nice moment that, um, that uh, Brene Brown uh, described um, that just putting your head down and going and going and going and going and going until you go into the side of the mountain. <laughs> and uh, what, 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 what one of us have not experienced uh, that at some point. Um, what else, you know, when you think about your own organizations and organizational theory and leadership theory, uh, there were quite a few bits there. What, um, what, what kind of jumped out for you? Throw, throw your hand up or I'll just uh, pick on somebody to kind of, kind of jump in. You're all looking at me like, Jonathan, that's a hard question. I bet you get has a little something she would love to share on that topic. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think um, thinking about how, how we can help to shape what we define leadership to be in the future. Mm -hmm. If we adopt this mindset that is non-binary. So, um, you know, a big word in, in my vocabulary is curiosity. So I think that's the first thing I think about is maybe a first step is getting really, really curious about what leadership can look like, you know, starting today or yeah. moving forward. Um, and I think they, they peppered it throughout this. They mentioned it, they talk about it. Um, they use lots of comparative references around finite and infinite and mm -hmm. binary and all those terms. But the curiosity piece is, um, I don't know, I'm really cu I, I'm curious to hear <laughs> what others have to say about it here. Like, how can we do this? How can we stop a pattern of, right. of that in leadership? Yeah, I thought there was, uh, you know, there was those, there was that section where they were talking about uh, vulnerability and, you know, without boundaries, it's dangerous. And, you know, maybe um, it's maybe oversharing, I think she said, or maybe it's attention seeking, but it's not being vulnerable. Um, and, you know, what, what are you doing when you're broadcasting, you know, it's validation of pain, uh, but it's not necessarily connection. And uh, I just thought that was a fascinating moment and to me really speaks to leadership uh, because um, there's the wrong kind of vulnerability. There's manipulative vulnerability and we see it on the internet all the time, um, but it, it's just pervasive now because there's a kind of permission for it. Um, and it's very hard to do anything with it when it happens to you. Uh, so where, you know, where are the gates and where are the boundaries? Uh, that, that sort of seems to me really interesting. Kim, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Um, you know, I, I know uh, uh, finding boundaries and working in a, in a complex organization like yours uh, is something that, um, you know, I know, I know comes up for you quite a bit. Uh, it does. And thanks for that. And having just 
joined or rejoined the YWCA a little over a year ago. Um, yeah, lots of balance. But I, I just also want to talk, go back a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the concept of good and bad and um, sharing and not, and I was reminded, so embedded throughout, especially in the foundation at the beginning of this talk between uh, uh, Seneca and Brené Brown, um, I could also see, you know, that the org organizational development change management tools that Senge talked about a long time ago, and in Senge's work, I really saw embedded in uh, many of the approaches, um, an essential Eastern or Buddhist approach, mm. which is the middle way. And so I, I see that, and also David Bohm's uh, work on um, deep listening, which is also, I think, uh, you know, see some older things. So um, in terms of like, I think there is such wisdom in those old practices that we as humans have known for a long time, but got excited about technology and change and forgot about our essential selves. So I think in many ways, it's a coming home to what we know to be true. And um, framing that or embedding that on um, uh, really good organizational structure practices and finding that balance. Nice. Nice. Who wants to build on that? How does that show up for you in your organizations? Nicola? Yeah, I was, I was thinking about it almost in a, a little bit of a different way. I was thinking yeah. about um, how some of this feels a little bit generational. So I feel like some of the um, evolutions in leadership that we're seeing are generational. So when you ask the question about, I think you get, how do we do this? Um, I was wondering if, if that will partly just kind of evolve. And actually, it's one of the parts of the podcast I took issue with, which is mm -hmm. when they were sort of talking about the loss of skill or the loss of skill development. Okay. And I, I'm not sure I... I'm not sure I buy that. I spend time with a lot of young people and I don't know, I'm just not seeing it. And a little bit of it felt like we, what we do with young people, right? We we're always worried about the next generation and the things that they can't seem to be able to do. And I don't know, it just, it just didn't, it's a bit of a tangent I know, but that part just didn't land for me. Yeah, there was, the, there was a little bit of that, you know, like, remember, if they bring in the television, they won't be able to think anymore, right? There was a bit of that going on. It felt a little fusty uh, to, to me in, in part. So, yeah, I would share that. Um, let, me, let me just uh, go around. Uh, Julie, what's, uh, what's on your mind as you're hearing this and you're thinking about your organization and boundaries and vulnerability? Yeah, I, I actually, for a couple of years, did a lot of work with some uh, international colleagues on, on vulnerability. Um, I'd been in a... Um, a two week residential course at Harvard when really we landed on um, you know, team dynamics and the, the forming, storming and, and norming stage. And we decided uh, instead of doing the classwork that we were gonna explore what had happened. And we talked mm. about vulnerability and, and the ability to have those conversations. Um, but we talked about it in that we were peers. And so we were able to get to a point of being extraordinarily vulnerable, like mm. not open the kimono and you go, oh, okay, we're going that far um, in order for us to you know, work through the team piece. But what we then talked about was how do you take that back to your teams? Because power is such an important part of that dialogue. Um, you know, when you're with colleagues and it wasn't an employment situation, you could do that. Um, but within your teams, you have to, as a leader, be very careful about how you start to, number one, you know, put out your vulnerability with an expectation that others should be comfortable to go that deep. Um, and then provide the scaffolding for the people if they do decide to share so that, you know, they have the emotional and, and all of the other tools they need um, to, to carry through. And, and so what, what I tend to do, we have uh, portfolio meetings with my, my group. Uh, every month and we've got one this afternoon and so bring forward different topics and I have different people lead them we did we talked about um, racism and, and diversity and inclusivity at the last meeting and we spent an hour half an hour was a number of people who'd been to a session and talked about what they learned and then it was a bit of a free conversation um, to explore uh, today just because of the lockdown and I know I've been <laughs> having a couple of bad weeks I'm actually talking about humor um, but it's a, oh, nice. it's a way to talk about stress. And, and, and so I've said, you've all got to bring something that makes you laugh. 
but actually the context is I want to make sure how's everybody feeling and how are you dealing with things and here's a tool that you should be using. And so I think that leaders have a responsibility to not throw vulnerability on the table and just let things happen. They, they have to support and manage the team to engage in that at their own stage and with their own choosing. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Laura, what are you thinking about? You're just on mute there, mate. My brain is like full. Um, <laughs> thinking about change management and you know how uh, patterns are established and then somebody comes in and disrupts them and and how many times you can do that before everybody uh, gets really sick of disruption. And um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a and, a, and the different people's different comfort levels with vulnerability and what that means for each of them, how, especially in the workplace with those power differentials that you're talking about. I don't really have any answers. I just like lots of questions going off. That's great. Yeah. Diane, what's, what's, uh, what's on your mind this year? as you're thinking about vulnerability and leadership and boundaries and? As my head is exploding as Laura's is, um, there are multiple threads that, that I could kind of pull together. Um, the whole idea of the, I think it started with Laura, the marketing that, you know, storytelling, it brings people in. But I think one of the things that I really have valued from both these authors is they also give you some nice concrete tools and the message in this podcast was your story will bring people in, but you have to have goals and tools to keep them there. Yeah. So, and I, you know, I think over the years, when you get people in and you start bringing in the tools and the goals align with the why or the vision, the stories build at different levels. Uh, and so I think that was one of the things that I, I hadn't heard in the room yet. Um, and the other around the, you know, Brene Brown and the vulnerability and everything Julie's saying, if you can, you can mentor vulnerability, it encourages others to, uh, also though, giving them permission not to be vulnerable. So if they don't want to be part of that exercise, um, and the, you know, the whole idea of the challenge group. So tons of thoughts, Jonathan, tons awesome. of thoughts. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Who haven't heard from from a while? Nancy, what's uh, what's going on for you as you're listening to, to these folks kind of trying to unpack their brains here a bit? <laughs> um, certainly vulnerability is something that we really dove into when we did our management training with Laraday that we just wrapped up. Mm. And it's something that I think a lot about. And um, everybody has a different response to that word right and they had talked about that and for me when I when I'm mentoring and coaching our managers here you can demonstrate vulnerability by just going back you know you have a conversation with the staff person and it doesn't go so well and it can be as simple as going back to say I screwed that up can we you know can we redo and also that sense of you know especially for younger managers that I've seen is they feel like they have to have all the answers all the time right so I will often say to them you don't have to have all those answers and if you don't you can say I don't have all those answers but let's work together to unpack and and discover those together so that's really something that we're working at here at, at Cornerstone is just really um really looking at what does vulnerability mean and how does it play out and it also really connects to me about those deep, meaningful connections. Because if you're not honest and truthful, um, you're never going to get there. And sometimes the honest and the truth is just the, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but we're going to figure it out together. So that's some of what I'm thinking about when I think about vulnerability. That's awesome. I, I think I want to also sort of throw in here, not that we probably want to spend a ton of time on, on parenting, but there was kind of a nice moment on parenting. Adversity teaches skill. And, you know, trauma really sets us back. Uh, you know, there's advantage to adversity and uh, we all maybe worry as parents that we bubble wrapping our kids, not allowing them to have any uh, exposure to adversity. Uh, and yet the way intergenerational trauma, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in the corporate world, whether it's in any, anywhere, any kind of community happens is when 
one generation experiences trauma and then re-traumatizes the next one and it becomes a very difficult cycle to break. And we see that pattern happen in lots of manifestations. It's a very masculine pattern, obviously. And um, I'd just be curious to hear, uh, you know, I've got lots of feminists on the line here, so I'd really be curious to hear some of your thoughts on, on that and how, how specifically it kind of relates to, to the parenting piece, because I think that's kind of, or at least families, community, however you want to kind of uh, go at it. it would be cool who can I convince to jump in you get uh yeah so I I like that you went there because I was I was thinking in that vein as well and thinking about working with families and, and spending so much time working with kids yeah um and one of the things that I think about is in how do we continue to practice to have the kinds of conversations where you bring topics to the table that are not problem solving focused? So to, to Julie's earlier point where maybe we just need to have, bring the word into the room. Let's talk about vulnerability. Let's talk about trust. Let's talk about these things. And whereas we tend to be very solution focused and definitely in the nonprofit world, okay, when we come together, we had a problem, let's solve it. And so we always wanna tie things up with a bow, but when do we have the conversations that talk about subjects that can actually stretch our thinking and invite mm -hmm. different perspectives? And this is where I lean to my experience as an educator of, of kids is they, they always, I'm a champion of them, they always have a lot to tell us. If we just watch how they have conversations and how they engage with the world, their curiosity is just there. They just go with it. They just talk about it and then they leave it and then they move on to something else. Um, <laughs> but it's funny how we create these constructs of what we think needs to happen when we're really passionate about something in a nonprofit where why do we have to always tie things up? And when can we make space to have those conversations where different voices come to play. Totally. Oh, wow. That was great. There was lots of nods happening there. Nicola. Yeah, I think uh, that's an interesting question you get. And I think it also goes back to what Nancy was describing with younger managers. And it ties into me to, to when Brene, and I mean, these are pretty generalized gender categories, but when she was talking about perfection being the biggest shame trigger for women. And if you think about a lot of nonprofit organizations, a lot of us are pretty heavily female, female dominated. And so I wonder if that's linked to that, that inability to have those conversations because we're trying to present everything perfectly first. And of course you can't have those conversations if, if you've got to start with perfection. Yeah, I, I admit, to, uh, I admit to, to using the perfection question as a coach fairly often do you consider yourself a perfectionist? It's usually a pretty break it open quickly question uh, because people admit to it. It's not a, it's not a like a heavily, uh, like at the surface, not a heavily shame thing, but as soon as you get into it and you unpack it, it, it it's big. <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, I'm mindful of the time. Uh, I definitely want a chance to go around one more. I've got, I think we've got a, a, a chance to just kind of do one or two more here and this one, and then I'll kind of try and hear from everybody. Alness. Yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick. I'm just, I, I, I found myself feeling, okay, so the concept of vulnerability, but with boundaries is a really interesting one. And I think really appealing one that resonated with me initially on the one hand. On the other hand, I actually felt a little suspicious of the work that boundaries as a word was doing. And I think it might've been because I just recently read this article about um, uh, how emotional intelligence has been used as a concept to um, bludgeon people. <laughs> and so um, I, I, what you just mentioned you get, I found really interesting. So I'm wondering what, I'm kind of like, I'm tempted to problematize boundaries as a, as a concept. And I'm wondering if what they mean is vulnerability is good so long as it's solution focused. But I don't know if I'm putting words in their mouth or not. This is my question. Because they're saying that I think vulnerability if it's self-interested is, um, just like attention seeking, or I had some other words down, I won't go look at them. Um, but I wonder, like, are they saying, I wonder, are they saying that like vulnerability is good as so long as you're doing it for a reason, they say selflessly, but I'm wondering, are they too, maybe too far ahead there? Is it okay to practice vulnerability that's not solution focused as a first step or in some situations? 
just curious. That that was my reaction to, to that uh, that topic. Who wants to who wants to help all this with that one? What are you thinking, Laura? Um, thanks, all this, and well, it's kind of tying together for something with something you get said as well, like this idea of staying open and curious and having those conversations. But um, when do we have time to do that? Like, and, and is there not a tension between our goal orientation and we're here at work for a reason, for reasons, mm. and, you know, to kind of clear the space to have those conversations. I almost, I think solution oriented to me sounds like extractive. I don't know, like, it doesn't actually sound like I, like sometimes, you know, we're there to solve a problem at work. And, and so we're extracting solutions and we're requiring an output. And that's almost to me the opposite of what we're talking about of being able to have real connections in, in real time and mm. the, the luxury of time. Oh, that's beautiful. I would uh, love to go around just so we end this more or less on the hour. And uh, my final question is, we've said a lot of stuff, but we've only just begun. Uh, what will you leave thinking about? What do you have more questions about? What is gonna be on your mind as you leave here? Today, I'm gonna to go around and uh, hear from everybody once if I can. I'm gonna start with Diane. Sure, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I think it's the whole concept of remaining curious. So, which I think you get has said a few times to keep the conversations open and allow contrary opinions and be comfortable in all of that and keep in mind that I wanna stay vulnerable, I wanna be curious um, and be okay if we all have different points of view and we stay in our different points of view, we just are curious about how we all are. Nice one. Thanks, Diane. Now let me go to Nancy. Um, well, I'm gonna watch it again. And I've also sent the link to uh, our management team and we've okay. got management meeting this afternoon. <laughs> so I'm gonna get them to all talk about it. Uh, and I think it'll be a really groovy conversation. So yeah, thanks nice for this. Time. Great way to start a Thursday. Loved it. Thanks, Nancy, that's great. Uh, Laura, and then I'll go to Olness. Yeah, I think I have to agree with Diane, like uh, this, I or kind of uh, jump off that. It's uh, this idea of we don't have to agree in every moment and we don't have to like stake out positions in our conversations. Nice one. Uh, Allness and then Kim. Uh, really great conversation. Really interesting to hear everyone's thoughts. And like I said, a great way to start a Thursday is a good way to put it. Um, I feel like I'll have lots of things to think about. I think like negotiating this vulnerability versus boundaries versus curiosity, um, uh, faith in everyone else on the team that I don't know about is going to be spinning around in my head for a while. Uh, see how it goes. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Uh, Kim and then Montana. Okay. My head is now like exploding more than it was when I was listening, but, um, and thanks for this. Uh, I've been inspired by all of you. So what I'm leaving with in this moment, uh, I, a door opened for me, so I need to explore it. Um, it's this sense of how women, especially, and going back to the gendered responses to vulnerability, um, but I, I'm wondering about how we shore up our vulnerability um, and almost become, um, or what I've seen uh, over the years, is uh, something that's almost performative, but more likely protective um, in terms of how we respond to other people um, so that we don't um, end up bearing uh, the potential negative consequences. So I'm really, I'm gonna be thinking about that more in terms of our staff and how that plays out because I've seen that so often and I think it gets characterized and mostly as being two-faced where you have a face that you present to a person um, and then speak about it in other places. But I, there's something there for me. That's great. Thanks, Kim. I'm on Tanner and then I'll go to Julie. I'm going to take away a lot around the theme of curiosity, um, especially with children. I mean, children are curious and 
I wonder how much of that has to do with them not having a product to get out of what they do every time. And they're in that moment of adventure. And where does that line happen when we grow up that like we notice that we need to make something now. And so that our focus shifts and how, how can I keep that curiosity for as long as possible? Awesome. Julie, and then who haven't I gone to? Is it Nicola? Have I gone to you there? No, Nicola next. Terrific. This has been uh, wonderful. And uh, thank you for convening. And Jonathan, I, I moved the media interview to make sure I could participate oh. in this. That's how important <laughs> it was. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm going to go back. I'm going to read more about the, the finite and infinite game um, because I'm, I'm doing a, a lot of institutional work around capital R reconciliation um, and started from what I'm able to frame now as being on two different teams. Um, and certainly a lot of the, the work that we're doing, uh, I'm understanding it's a, a journey and, and you know, there are milestones, but there is no destination. But yesterday we had a really big breakthrough and uh, one of the members of the, um, the other team as it had been framed, I think, um, said, you know, I know we're making progress because yesterday I defended Trent. And, and so thinking about it today, it's like, oh, we are all on the same team. And so it's that reframing and thinking about it and, and how we talk about that when we do come to the table um, is, is, I think, just going to again help me think about this. It's given me language, right? That's what they said. They've given me the language I didn't really have before to frame this journey together uh, on the same team. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Nicola, and then you get, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, echoing everyone else's thanks. And yeah, my head is also also full. You know, what I'm leaving with is, is really almost a need to go back to the basics of the vulnerable leadership piece. And what all this really raised for me is, I think we've done a lot of talking at our, in our leadership team about, um, you know, what is vulnerable leadership? What does it look like? I think we've kind of missed why. Like, why is it important? Um, and I, I don't mean totally, but I don't know that we've actually asked that explicit question in a lot of the conversation. Um, that we were having today was, it, it's not like I don't think it's important, but I don't know that we've clearly articulated that. Thanks, Nicola. And you get? Uh, I think the first thing I feel um, is this overwhelming sense of gratitude. Uh, the fact that I get to be in this space right now with all these amazing people um, and have this kind of conversation. So that's my first, that's my feeling. I'm framing this around a Brené idea. And then my behavior is this, is this my, my decision after listening to so much of this thinking, yeah, okay, continue the work of challenging assumptions in, in whatever it is, my own, my family, my work, wherever it is. So it's my behavior. And then the thinking I'm left with is the, the why we um, don't build boundaries um, in a vulnerable way, <laughs> if that makes sense, as opposed to just building boundaries around solutions. I'm just, so that's what I'm thinking about. And thank you for making this conversation happen. It's great. Nice, nice. Well, that brings us uh, to the end. I am going uh, to be thinking about um, sometimes in life, happy accidents happen uh, and you have a whimsical idea and a thing happens. As they say on the internet, I did a thing. And um, I, uh, I'm gonna think about, um, maybe we can do this again sometime, somehow, some way, uh, because I think it's useful. I think we don't uh, carve out enough time and cancel things and say, let's, let's actually have a think. Uh, you know, and not a problem solve. That feels, that feels good to me. So I want to thank you all so very much. And if you listened in and you're out there, then um, thanks for listening in as well. And all the best. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank Cheers, you. everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody.